I'd like to welcome Dr. Chris Priest, um, who is a reader in sustainability and computer systems at the University of Bristol. So prior to being at Bristol, he uh, he worked. He was the head of sustainability sustainable IT research at HP Labs uh, in Bristol. Um, he holds a degree in pure maths from the University of Warwick and a PhD in logic programming from Imperial College London. Um, so please join me in welcoming Chris. Thank Priest. you. Okay, so I'm going to do two talks in the hopes that you'll find at least one of them interesting. Um, they're, they're both about sustainability, but they're both coming in from very different directions. And so uh, I'll start off with a bit of sort of general stuff about my team, which will show you uh, how we're coming in. And also, I'll just to say, I'm really happy to be interrupted if you guys got questions uh, that you want to do. Of course, if you interrupt me too much, then we might end up going over the hour. Just be warned. Okay. Um, the second talk, I'll say, is more connected with limits, and so I think I would be interested to have a little conversation about limits as part of that towards the end of that. Yeah. Okay, so the first one, uh, well, I'll get into that. First of all, I'll tell you a bit about the team. This is basically about citizen engagement around sustainability. How can we get groups of people to engage on sustainability issues, and one particular project we did in Bristol. And it's also connected with gamification, uh, competition, and why we don't think it's always a good thing. Um, but I want, first of all, I wanted to tell you a bit about my team, uh, the uh, Sustainability and Computer Systems team. We have, I, that's obviously me, and I've got two uh, RAs, which is postdocs, Dan and Paul, and uh, three PhD students currently with me. Um, and our research, basically my, my interest in research, so as you probably gathered from my very brief bio, I've been all over the place. I used to be at uh, Hewlett Packard Research Labs. I have always been passionate about sustainability and tried to make it uh, a smaller or larger part of my professional life as much as possible. I was radicalised at the age, age six by Dr. Zeus, um, by uh, the, the Lorax. Um, uh, and, and so I have kind of tried to make it part of my professional life at Hewlett Packard. And I was most successful towards the end of my time at Hewlett Packard it, when I had a, a team of folks who were uh, working with HP uh, on how climate change is likely to change the business landscape. What what risks and opportunities there were for Hewlett Packard as a result, of, or there are for Hewlett Packard as a result of, of climate change changing the business landscape over time. Um, but where, what I'm interested in then, and that fits in with what I was doing at HP, but even more so now in academia, I'm interested in uh, basically sustainability challenges, design of digital systems, and human behavior. And my main interest is uh, where they intersect. I saw John Froelich has a diagram, maybe others uh, also have it, where he has his research interests and he has his various projects mapped off across there. And so I try to sit here, but I have some things which sit outside there. Um, so I have some things which are more kind of not quite so connected with sustainability. I have some work in education and also mental health, mental well-being, which sits here. But my main interest is in the sustainability side of things. Um, so when I focus on sustainability, we have really two key questions. The first is, if you look at digital services around the world, what is the environmental impact of digital services? How do they change people's behavior? And how do those behavior, ch how do those behavior changes result in uh, changes to the impact of the services that are being provided? Uh, and also, how can we think about designing those digital services to uh, reduce their uh, negative impact and increase their positive impact? So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, how can digital services engage people uh, in response to sustainability challenges. So that's broadly our, our research agenda. I'm going to talk about this first and that second. Okay, so some of our partners, we've done a lot of work with The Guardian. Uh, the Guardian, uh, well, I'll talk more about that in the second talk. We're also with the BBC. Both of, the, those, both of those I'll talk more about in the second talk. We also work with the UK Environment Agency, our equivalent of your EPA. Uh, Sustain, which is an environmental consultancy. EDF, which is a large, uh, low-carbon um, uh, energy provider. It's French, and for French, low-carbon means mostly nuclear, with some, uh, <laughs> some uh, green stuff on top of it. Um, they are, I mean, they are serious about low-carbon, but uh, the French strategy is build lots of nukes uh, and, and have uh, to ca cover the base load and then some... Uh, um, uh, the intermittent stuff is dealt with by, by the other. So, so how do they handle the, the waste product afterwards, like long-term storage of... Uh, so I, I, I will ask my guys that. I haven't actually had that conversation with them, what they think, <laughs> what they think about what their plans on, on long-term long -term storage. Um, we it's can, pretty long-term. Yeah, yeah. Right, so yeah. The, Maybe they'll, because I think, was it you that showed us those pictures? Those, uh, someone at the, at the workshop uh, uh, had the pictures of 
uh, where they got student projects or uh, where they crowdsourced ideas for vast. Oh, oh right, no, 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 that was that was um, uh, Sam. She had those. Yeah. Yes. So things to build on top of nuclear waste dumps so that people uh, 10, uh, in ten thousand years. years don't do something stupid with them. Just like Markham, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Is... yeah. Oh but anyhow, um, but we can have a conversation about that later on. I, I okay. should I should speak with my uh, the guys I speak with are mainly around, which is why I work with them. They're mainly around uh, making. Um, homes more energy efficient because EDF, uh, in fact all, uh, all companies have a responsibility, all energy companies in the UK have a responsibility to help people make their homes more energy efficient. And so that's the work that I do with them. And finally, the Carbon Disclosure Project. Who's heard of the Carbon Disclosure Project? No one. Look it up. I'm not going to say anything more about it, but if you don't know about the Carbon Disclosure Project, you need to know about the Carbon Disclosure Project if you're interested in sustainability. And I can't tell the story behind it, I haven't got enough time but it's worth finding out the story about how it happened. Um, I have a question on the residential. Yeah. What is the um, energy or use uh, between residential and non-residential in, in, uh, over there? Uh, in so the in terms of carbon footprint in yeah, the UK, use. in the UK, so in the UK, if we've not, I can't <coughs> quote for energy, I quote for, for, ed, for electricity it will be higher. Okay. For carbon footprint, it's about a third of the UK's carbon footprint is residential, residential is energy use. Okay. Yeah. And uh, most of that will be heating. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's start. So what I want to talk to talk is to talk about Close the Door, which is a community organisation which we, we worked with. Uh, uh, basically, it is a campaign that's directed at shops in the UK. It's trying to get them to keep their doors shut in winter. And keeping a door shut in winter can have substantial impact on energy use. It can roughly, uh, basically having a door open will waste a third to half of your heating energy. So it's very substantial. Um, and there is a community norm towards keeping doors open because people think shops uh, are closed if the, if the doors are shut. Um, uh, and it has a small number of dedicated volunteers around the country. Different cities have different numbers. This is the entirety of Bristol Close the Door. Um, and so it's not a large... Um, uh, not a large campaign, a campaigning body. Uh, what we are interested in thinking about is how, given that you have a small number of dedicated volunteers, how can you have lightweight volunteers to support them? And this idea didn't come from me or my team. It actually came from this guy who was, at the time, an undergraduate student uh, uh, at Bristol um, who wanted, uh, who, and he, he was uh, kind of supporting this. So he came to us saying, what can we do? So it was very much a bottom-up student initiative. Um, and how can, how can, so how can lightweight volunteers help support campaigning organizations, and how can digital technology share information to change the norm? That's what we were looking at. So this is what we built. We built a close the door app, which basically allows you to log if a door is open or closed. As you're going around your everyday business, you can say, oh, I'm going past Starbucks, it's got it open, I'll log it as open. Um, and so it allows you to, um, so you, um, and then it displays it on a map. If it's red, it's always open. If it's green, it's always closed. If it's yellow, it's sometimes open, sometimes closed. Um, and it deployed so you can use that map. The campaigners can use that map to help them think about where to visit, where to focus, and also to see which regions. So you could see in Bristol that you could see where they were having an effect. You could see, for example, Gloucester Road, which is near where I live, it was going green, whereas the uh, centre, the shopping centre in town, was all red, partly because of design features. It was not designed to have the doors closed. Um, and we, d we developed three. We wanted to do a bit of uh, science, psychology, positivist stuff. Um, and so what we did is we, did, we, did, we had three um, versions, of, uh, uh, um, or two versions of this app, but we used it in three different ways. One version which was gamified, and people, as they collected this data, would receive points, and they would appear on a leaderboard so they could compete against each other. And we also had a control version which allowed them to gather the data without this gamification. Um, so what we did is we split, we had, um, we recruited subjects, we recruited subjects in two ways. We got a load of um, people through environmental notice boards, online environmental notice boards. We also got people from more general notice boards over time. And we split them into three groups, a control group, which received a control app, uh, virtual rewards group, and the financial rewards group. So uh, each group was paid to participate. They were given roughly 20 pounds, $30 to participate. Um, the control group and virtual rewards group received just that. The financial rewards group didn't receive that. Instead, there was a pot of money of the same size, and they received a share based on their performance. So those that got higher scores would receive a larger share of the pot. We shared it out based on the score. Okay. We got survey data from all the groups before and after. after. 
uh, about their opinions about digital technology, their opinions about environmental matters, etc. Uh, and we also got the quantitative data on their actual performance. How many doors did they log? And we can carry out extended interviews with 18 of the subjects to get some more one, uh, qualitative data about what was going on. So this is the quantitative results. What I've done here is we've got a group of 16, each three groups of 16. They're lined up um, so that the highest scoring in each group is here and the lowest scoring in each group is here. So you can see this is the score, which is, which is equivalent roughly to the number of doors that they logged. They also would score more for going to someone new. So it wasn't only the number of doors they logged. So what you can see, first of all, is that very clearly the green group is dominating. That is the financial group, the pay for results. So that pay for results did, really did have an effect on incentivizing them, which is why companies like it. Um, uh, but it had also, in uh, uh, existing literature, has said something about this, and our results corroborated this, and that is that pay for results erodes intrinsic uh, willingness to do a task. And what we found was that and so we have, we have weak evidence that supports this in line with the others. What we find, we asked, we didn't actually carry on, but we asked everyone, would they be willing to carry on using the app after the experiment? And we stopped paying them. Everyone in the control and the virtual group said yes. In the financial group, about two thirds said yes, one third said no. Okay, so that's not a strong data set, but it is evidence in line with previous research which shows that pay for results does erode people's willingness to uh, do something for free in the longer term. It erodes their intrinsic motivation. So that's, the, that's the, all I want to say about the financial. <coughs> What's interesting is the difference between the control and the virtual. Remember, the control has no leaderboard. The virtual has a leaderboard. Uh, so it, there's a competition going on. And you'll see, if you look here, the group, the virtual group, which has the leaderboard, is beating the control group here. And then it swaps over. The um, control group is beating the leaderboard. And so what's happening, if you look at these two, the leaderboard has resulted in a skewing. It's resulted in those at the top um, marking more doors, those at the bottom marking less doors than the control group. And so it's resulted in a skew. And we argued at the time, when we first published this paper, which is 2013 Kai, that this is because the competition up here is demotivating those lower down. And there was evidence, there was qualitative evidence to support that. And we gathered that qualitative evidence by interviewing these six, uh, these six, and these six. And we analyzed the qualitative data. So that's what we said at the time. We were partly right, we were partly wrong. Something more subtle was going on. And I'm going to go into that in more detail. But the key message here is that if you, do you want to say, sorry, no, you're holding your glasses. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, the key message here is that the competition motivates those at the top and results in poorer performance of those at the bottom. If you want, um, to a few people performing strongly. Competition's not bad, but if you want the best out of the group, which is what we want, that's not necessarily a good approach. Okay, so I'm not gonna go, so we, this is based on the qualitative results. I'm not gonna go into a lot of information about this, but if you're interested, it's in the paper. The different things which motivated and enabled people to do, a bit like this is kind of inspired by Fogg, Fogg's kind of uh, um, approach to uh, motivators and enablers to, uh, to encourage action. And so we, we, we analysed to look what, what motivated and demotivated. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail just because of time, but there is um, information in the paper for anyone that is interested in, in that. So as a result of that, we made, we made um, recommendations. And one of the things that came up, I think this is really interesting, um, is, I will briefly go back to that, the um, slide. Uh, okay, here. Um, the woman who scored very highly in the control group there, she was uh, a, a mum who had a young baby and would push her young baby around and lock doors as she went around. So her, her lifestyle fitted in really well. And what we found is that environmental attitude, environmental strongly, being strongly environmentally motivated was not a strong predictor of significant contribution to this. Lifestyle was more important. And so as a result of that, we believe that if you want to recruit these kind of lightweight volunteers to support a community cause, what you want to do is not go to the environmental groups, but instead go to groups that have an appropriate lifestyle. In our case, there's a, a forum called Mumsnet in the UK, which is for parents of young children to discuss. Uh, um, and we would, so you would go there and have an environmental message. You say, do you want to help out an environmental cause? 
uh, just while you're going about, a bit of lightweight volunteering, have an environmental message. But no, you, you're not going and trying to recruit environmentalists, you're trying to rec recruit young parents, parents of young children, who are interested in the environment. That's the way you do it. Um, and so that was the, our first recommendation. Also, use financial motivation carefully. That goes back to what I was saying earlier on. Make competition available, but easy to ignore. So the competition was motivating for some, but demotivating for others. And also provide info regarding community norms in ways which motivate behavior. So that's, I'm gonna talk more about that now. So what's going on in the middle? As I said, we originally said that competition at the top demotivated those in the middle and the bottom. Um, that wasn't exactly what happened. Something more subtle was going on. And we saw some evidence of what we call normalizing behavior, which is that people were using the um, leaderboard to make decisions about what is an appropriate contribution to this community. In other words, how do I play my part? Not I want to be a winner, but I want to be an average member of the community. I want to do something that fits in with what everyone else is doing. I don't want to be right at the bottom. I'm not bothered about being at the top. So we did more analysis of the qualitative data to try to understand this in more detail. And so we, we did basically grounded theory type approach, reviewed the transcripts, tagging language that expressed attitude to a leaderboard. Um, whenever someone said, I felt good or bad about the leaderboard, we would tag it. Um, and we tagged whether the attitude was positive or negative or neutral. And then we looked at the different subject groups. Were they in the financial, uh, where were they? Were they high performers, middle and performers, low performers? Yeah, okay. The attitudes we identified, we identified three kinds of attitudes. The first is self-competitive, which is I am um, using the leaderboard to judge my own contribution and try to do better than I used to do. And we found that was always positive. The other competitive, we found two examples, negative and positive. Uh, negative, when I, um, I feel that I'm getting, uh, I'm just dropping back, so I'm losing, and I can't be bothered to take part. Positive was there are people near me, and I, I, that motivates me to, to go a bit higher. And finally, we, we found examples of normalizing, which is where you look at the leaderboard to think about how you can contribute to the community. So this is the results. And what we found is that the high scorers were all, uh, all four of the high scorers expressed competitive attitudes, other competitive attitudes. The people in the middle, four of the, sorry, three of the four expressed um, normalizing attitudes uh, to the leaderboard and some self-competitive. Uh, and in the low scorers, you see um, two of the four expressed negative attitudes to the leaderboard. Uh, some expressed normalizing other competitive attitudes. Those were more about getting started. So the leaderboard provided motivation for them get, to get started, and then they lost interest. Uh, so what's going on here? You see here, our original claim was that these people were being put off by the leaderboard, but there's no evidence for that in the qualitative data. So what is going on? And the reason is... Um, because, so that's, I've just said that, it's because of the structure of a leaderboard. A leaderboard is a poor way of encouraging communities to move towards a norm. Um, and if you look at, think about the structure of a leaderboard, if you've got people at the top who are competing strongly, and people at the bottom who are demotivated, then to appear in the middle, the people at the top have no effect on your score. What determines where you go in the middle is you must beat the demotivated people at the bottom. And so if competition pulls the demotivated people down, then to be in the middle, you need to score less than you would have done if there had been no competition. Okay. So that is what we found. It's basically uh, that a leaderboard encourages performance at the median rather than the mean. And competition skews the median to be lower than the mean. That's, that's what goes on. So some people view the leaderboard competitively, which can be motivating if you're near the top, or it can be demotivating. But others view it as a means of judging norms of contribution, and the contribution of such people can be pulled down if there's demotivated competitors underneath them on the leaderboard. So leaderboard is not a great means of uh, encouraging normalizing behavior. So when is competitive gamification appropriate? So we believe it is appropriate in some circumstances. It's if you want to encourage excellence in a small number of participants and are not bothered about everyone else. And there's good examples of that. Fold it in citizen science. How many of you have come across that? Yeah, okay. So fold it is a game where you create new structures, uh, protein structures. And they aren't interested in, in having vast numbers of people uh, doing, make, creating useless structures. They're in interested in creating, if you like, lay experts. And so creating competition, which encourages a small number of people to invest large amounts of time in learning how to fold proteins, 
is uh, a good thing from their point of view. Okay, and they use competition. Um, but if you're interested in the overall contribution, which is what we wanted, we weren't interested in having a few, num few people getting lots. We wanted lots of people getting a little. Uh, then competition is demotivating. Uh, it's not. It's self-defeating. And so we believe that you need to use normification, which design, basic designing to encourage a sense of doing one's bit, being part of a community, um, pulling your weight. Bonnie. Yes. Yeah, I basically agree with the point you're making, mm. although in the case of Folded, um, the people who were involved got together in little cooperatives and actually produced software to make it easier to solve the problem. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of neat because they were really collaborating and forming these little communities. Yes, so it wasn't yeah. all competition. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah. a really good point. And in fact, yeah, that fits very much to my experience at HP and where HP went wrong. So I know you used to be Hewlett Packer. When Hewlett Packer went wrong, when they changed their mechanism, at one point, at one point there, their um, uh, pay for rewards encouraged teamwork. And towards the end of my time, uh, they changed their pay for rewards to, in a way that actually discouraged teamwork. And what, so basically, if competition can be done in such a way that it encourages, it brings people, together. It brings people yes. together to encourage a small number of people doing well, then that's really good. Right. Yeah. Mm. Um, so. Finally, perhaps in our case, a hybrid adaptive architecture might be most effective. And this is what my next research proposal will look like, trying to get money out of the UK government. Um, so you, um, basically, what we're imagining is that you want something which combines competition and normalizing in an appropriate way. And what we're thinking about is that you have a system which kind of has three views. First of all, your default view is one with, that encourages contribution to the community. Uh, an average contribution, and it will show the average contribution per member and your contribution. Total contribution, how much we've all together done, what the average contribution is and what your contribution is. And then you can decide if you want to do a little bit better. And maybe we'll have some self-competition in through badges, which is quite commonly used, uh, bronze, silver and gold. For, um, but then also we want to know how, we, how can we use this, this kind of competitive spirit that some people have. And we would have a top 10% of contributors on leaderboard, but that leaderboard is hidden. It's not the default view. It's something that people would choose to go on to. They might be informed if they're on it. Um, they, they could, uh, um, uh, so that you, it's, it's not in your face, if you see it. It's not the basic way. And if that happens, if we could imagine that, that basically people would move to the leaderboard when they're in the top 10% and compete with each other, and that will drive the overall, uh, the mean up, which in turn will drive this up. And so the competition of the top 10% will be hidden from those in the middle, but nonetheless will have an effect on driving up the mean. And that's, that's kind of our architecture for trying to create an environment which encourages the people. If they want to be competitive, they can be, but it doesn't get in the way of uh, put off everyone else and tries to encourage a more cooperative and community-based approach for everyone else. So that is about it. I'm, I'm not going um, uh, to go uh, into that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll finish there for, for today, since you guys are more into the limits side, I'll talk more about that. Yeah. Okay, so crowdsourcing, it can be used to influence the community, um, it can be used to influence the community's social norm, and those social norms can also be used to motivate and engage crowdsourcers to contribute. And uh, this really summarizes what I said, competitive gamification promotes excellence, but doesn't get the best out of the community necessarily. Um, but normalizing motivations and competitive motivations can interact in a surprising way. In our case, it was a negative interaction. But we believe that it's possible to create, by appropriate design of the system, we can create more positive interactions between this competition and cooperation, normalizing community-based approach. Um, so particularly if you have some kind of personalization and adaptation of what people are, are, are shown. Okay, so thank you. That's it. Those are these are the references. This is the one that I didn't go into, and that's about how. Sorry, no, this one. It's a, an extended abstract, which is about how you can use this information to encourage behaviour change among the shops. Actually, I'm curious. Um, what do you think about uh, cooperation? This kind of mechanism in uh, gamification, or put in another way, how about if small teams compete with other teams? That's so, that, so to an extent, that's what uh, I think to, Bonnie was hinting at that. That's, mm -hmm. So it's true that you, if you create uh, environments where you have cooperation within teams and then competition between teams, mm -hmm. uh, then that's another way of doing it. I, I think my, my hunch is that that would be a good way to, again, get excellence. You'll be creating excellent teams rather than excellent individuals, which is what you want. But still, it isn't necessarily the best way of getting um, good performance out of the whole community. So the question is always whether you want a small number of excellent 
performers, whether they're individuals or teams, or whether you want to get the, the, the um, most out of the whole community. And that depends partly on the problem that you're looking at. Okay, any more questions? Because if not, I'll move on. There you are. Yeah, I have a little yeah. question, and I might be able to find this reading your paper, but um, how did you uh, like get your crowd? Um, can you speak briefly on that? Yes, so we were, in this particular case, we recruited, and we recruited through two mechanisms. One was environmental online notice boards mm -hmm. in Bristol, mm -hmm. and the other was through Gumtree in Bristol again. I okay. think it was Gumtree. It was some local community notice board, which okay. was not in... So what we were trying to do was get a mixture of people who were environmentally motivated and mm -hmm. not necessarily right. strongly environmentally motivated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I missed the initial slide, so correct me if I'm wrong. So since the app is more based on geospatial locations, mm -hmm. so when a person or a volunteer wants to take pictures of the doors being open or probably the ones that are violating the yeah. norms, mm -hmm. so isn't that a limited data set for people to sort of go out and like limited data points for people to actually take the picture and bring themselves up in the leaderboard? Yeah, so they don't, um, you don't take the picture you log whether a door is open or shut. You don't have to take a photo, okay. you log. And uh, you can add new doors. And in fact, what we found um, is that even though it was mainly Bristol, we found that the people, some people went to London for the weekend, some people went up north for the weekend, and we had these doors appearing in London and, 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 the, and the north as well as, as time went on. So, so there isn't a limited data set. We're actually encouraging the participants to, um, if you like, add information to the map about locations. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that yeah, answer? but then the only thing I'm confused is unless and until I actually see it, I wouldn't be able to record that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. Then, yeah. In, in my normal day-to-day -day life, how yeah. many doors would I actually end up seeing? Well, the that, that's the point is, uh, uh, in your normal day-to-day -day life, you go past a lot of doors. Yeah. Uh, and then the question is, it, will you take the time to lock them as you go past them? So, um, yeah, so, uh, so Bristol is slightly different from Irvine in that Bristol is very much a city centre university. Uh, and so... Uh, the students don't live in halls of residence. Well, they do, but the halls of residence are scattered among. So, so just by walking, people who are walking to work, there's, again, also the other thing is, is difference maybe between the UK and the US, is that uh, uh, in Bristol, a lot of people will walk. A lot, there'll be a lot of, particularly students, a lot of students will be walking along shopping streets to get, um, get to the university. And so it really was just part of their everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, there, yeah, you were. So I'm not in, uh, I the informatics field, I'm more in the public management mm -hmm. field. So I guess my question is more from that perspective, wanting to understand like the, if you have suggestions for other literature that connects this this work with like policy making. Mm. Mm. Um, I know that in the UK um, that we talk, there's a lot of scholarship on co-production policy and how citizens in, in this type of using technology are kind of co-producing Either you know, in this, it's co-producing. They're and they're not necessarily co-producing public service here, but they're actually saving energy in a way. So it, it kind of fits within mm. that kind of mm. framework. So I'm just trying to make this link, and I'm curious if you might have any. So points it's um, it's not linked directly to public policy. Uh -huh. um, we had some frustrations about trying to roll it out further. Um, and that was partly linked to policy, it was partly linked to the organisation we were working with. So the two local people who were keen on this, the national head, felt this was too um, campaigny. They were more interested in having conversations with, with, uh, shop, with uh, shop chains to try to get the chains to uh, change their, their uh, approach. And also we had a, a conversation with the local council. At one point the local council were quite positive about it, but again they, it almost was like someone else spoke to them in between our first conversation and second conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so um, uh, it didn't, uh, there wasn't a kind of, I can't say that there's a clear kind of policy. So one thing that there is, that one, one policy link here is that some of these chains do have policies mm -hmm. and close the door is linked, uh, has conversations with those chains about keeping doors shut. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that this kind of information is useful for them to feed back about which shop managers are forgetting and remind the shop manager that actually this is a policy, you know, you don't need to keep the door open, no. the policy is to keep the doors shut. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, but I don't have a lot, in terms of public policy, not, I don't really have. Right, right, and it's, I mean like, well, there's all this with the advocacy when things look like advocacy, people kind of like... Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. We did have that experience. In fact, our um, 
there was a, at CHI 2013, there was a workshop on um, activism. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, we chose to put activism in our title. Mm -hmm. And the head of Close the Doors was very irritated about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're going to... Uh, I, I, yes, uh, I'm sure, again, this might be in the paper, but I'm curious. Did you have any issues with data quality specifically? Yes, so that is in the paper. That was something the reviewers pointed, uh, brought up, and that was a concern they had. We didn't. I actually did, after the reviewer had made that point. So one thing we did to ensure data quality, we were afraid that competition might, is that you could only log a door when your GPS showed that you were close enough to actually be able to see it. I see. That was the, one of the kind of anti-cheat things. Right. But I, did, uh, I, I checked 10% of the data quality against Google, Google Maps, 2013 this would have been, and uh, I found no mistakes. I found one thing that I thought was a mistake, and then I found out that our guys were right and Google Maps was wrong in that particular <laughs> case. So, so, um, so in fact, it was, it was finding better quality at that time than Google Maps. So it, it was more up to date. Yeah. Mm. So. Okay. Can you get Google to pay for it since you'll be improving the maps? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it somehow. <laughs> Thank you. Right.